So I'd like to welcome everybody to another episode of Rounders Reconne uh, Reconnected. And it's my absolute pleasure. And I've been doing lots of reading up and snooping around the history um, of Rounders, but particularly our particular guest today. Um, and it's it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dana Abdul Kar Kar Karim. That's right, isn't it? Abdul Kareem, yes. Kareem, yes, that's right. Um, who's been a player, is on the board and is now part of the coaching team, uh, talent and development team in Rounders and has a fascinating history, not just in Rounders, but in, in sport in general. So welcome. Hello. Hiya. If you could, uh, if we just start off really of, of you first involved, not just particularly Rounders, but actually in sport in general, you know, your 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 history around sport and uh, as a young person and and how how then you got into rounders it's absolutely fascinating I'd love you to share that with us yeah absolutely um well I'm the second of five siblings so playing games began in the back garden we were the only um diverse family uh, I'm half Palestinian half English in our village and I didn't need to find neighbors to play with I had my brothers and sisters so whatever it was, whether it was football, rollerblading, bikes, cricket, rounders, you name it, we learned and played together in the backyard. And then I went to an infant school and a primary school in Rotherham where sport was really important. And it was just a normal, you know, I went to Rose Hill and Rycroft schools and through being in a school where sport was valued and was given an important place. I had the chance to do cross country runs, to play on the boys football team. I was that girl on the boys football team, to play cricket, to play rounders, to just get fully immersed in it and realized actually I'm pretty good at this. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I like being involved in team sports and my school were really keen to get involved. And my earliest, my earliest days with rounders, I can remember in, in primary school, we played tournaments in the kind of raw marsh league and we used a flat bat, which I now know is the wrong kind of bat. And um, <laughs> I remember there was, a, there was a really big tree on the pitch. So it became a tactic to hit the ball into a tree because then you're more likely to get round. It didn't stop the game. It wasn't void. So we trained to hit the ball into the tree. Um, but I can remember that must have been in Y5, Y4, Y5. So I was about 10 years old. And just through playing with school and being around teachers who valued it, I had these brilliant experiences and then went to secondary school. I went to an all girls um, private school, Sheffield Girls, where again, sport is a really big part of the culture. And it was at that point where people started to notice it wasn't just that I liked these sports, it was actually quite good. And I, through various different opportunities, went on to represent my city, my county, my region, my country um, in lots of different sports as a Muslim woman, as a Muslim woman that at 15, 16 started wearing the headscarf at a time when that was very, very difficult. And I played football for in the kind of England talent pathway with Sheffield United in their centre of excellence. I got picked up at a school rounders tournament by um, somebody that worked with what used to be the National Rounders Association and Rounders used to be the stronghold within Sheffield. So somebody that knew the game spotted me in a tournament and said, you may want to play. And I came and started playing and I turned up as like an 11 year old on this adult women's team. And I can remember the team kit, it was sponsored by um, a, a, an alcoholic drink. So- Oh, wow. <laughs> I know, so a Muslim girl came home and I showed my dad, I was like, yeah, I've, I've made the team. Um, and it was the Chris Gothard was the team, um, which I, I don't even know the name, why it came from that. And I showed him my team shirt and it was just a giant pint glass. And my Arab dad was like, what is this? And I was like, well, everybody else is an adult. And this was the kit, this was, it was sponsored. So I was an 11 year old Muslim girl playing in the Sheffield Rounders League, the pint glass on my shirt, um, but learning how to play against adult women who themselves were England players. And, and from there, just opportunity after opportunity, I've been very fortunate. And now it is my career. I am a PE teacher. I'm sat here in my PE clothes and I get to, and I learned through my own playing how much teaching others really mattered and how much it was important for me to pass on that love and passion and the chance to travel and, and and see the world and compete and all those things I've got through sport. So it's also now my career. 
Wow. And you can hear the passion in your voice about sport and what it really meant to you and, and the difference it made to you. Um, was that a natural in your family? Was sport in your family? No. Um, I think we would say my family are allergic to sport. Um, <laughs> they are very keen for me to do it. And my brothers might tell you that they know about football, but they know about it if it's using your thumbs on a console or watching other people play. Um, no, it, it, it was my thing. It was my passion. They, they, I enjoy playing recreational level sports with my sister. I played a bit of squash. She used to do a little bit of athletics and school-based sport, but that was my arena. That was where I found that I excelled. I also liked the challenge. Um, I'm now, I would call myself somebody that is a runner and I've, I've done, I did the London marathon last year and I've never really been a runner, uh, but I like how difficult I find it. I like that. It's not natural because you put a ball in my hand. That is quite natural. You put a ball at my feet. I'm coordinated. I'm balanced. I can, I can learn things quite quickly, but my siblings, they're, they're, they're very good supporters of me in sport but not so keen themselves. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and actually the support of the family is just so important, isn't it, when you're beginning to excel at something? And how fabulous that you're an all-rounder. Well, it it helps with my uh, with teaching and especially yeah. when teaching boys, if suddenly I then show a little bit of a skill, they're like, oh, right, okay, respect. But it, it, again, it I was grew up with a ball at my feet and in my primary school, we our break times were not on grass. They were on tarmac and you had two choices. You either watched the boys playing football with a tennis ball mm. or you stood at the side getting cold. So I decided I didn't want to get cold and I joined in. And at first I was terrible and I would toe poke it. But learning how to play with a very small ball meant I transitioned then to the big ball quite easily. And I think I've always, I, you know, I, I joke about it with children, you know, to give me a ball and throw it around. I'm like that episode of Friends. I could just throw the ball quite contentedly all day I enjoy being able to learn how to do something I don't always enjoy that I'm not good at it at first I do find that hard but I enjoy when I've mastered it and when it comes to reading games being involved in a team sport it allowed me to build my own identity as a as a as a minority woman as a person that was the only Muslim to then still feel part of a team it was a really important experience for me and I think certainly has shaped many of the decisions about how I to go about things and, and how I would identify myself. Being a Muslim is such a visible part of my identity, but being a sportswoman, I think is just as important and being somebody that mm -hmm. understands what it means to be a team player, what it means to be committed and to show that discipline. I think it's a really important skill that then helps in all aspects of life so I'm incredibly grateful that this was something I learned I could do um, and it has helped me at all kinds of times you know I was having this conversation in the middle of the GCSEs sport is really important for stress relief and I learned that really young so I know when I need to go out for a run or go out for a walk and being able to now pass that on to young people about look, go and get some fresh air, go outside, here's a ball, do what you need to do, because they're stressed. And I learned that as part of my character. And so I will always be grateful that sport gave me that. Yeah, and, and it is such a de-stressor. I know I um, my background's rugby league, and quite often if I've got a load of rugby league players in front of me and they're not concentrating, I just send them out to tackle because it's just a great stress reliever and they come back and they refocus and that is sport isn't it Absolutely. um around that and mental health and well-being um and, and what was it like then the first ever um muslim uh, hijab muslim to actually represent england now that just wasn't at rounders was it, it was it was at other sports as well yes it, would it have was been in all sports pretty it unfamiliar at that time uh, yeah, so this was in, I first represented my country in 2000 and I have 67 caps, international caps throughout my uh, rounders career. I was playing sport to quite a high level in many different sports at this point. I was involved in athletics and competing against Jess Ennis-Hill. Um, she went to a local school and so 
you know, I was able to, I could throw really far, but I couldn't hurdle and high jump like her. Mm -hmm. I was playing football in the centre of excellence on the England play pathway and had played under um, the eyes of the then England coach, Hope Powell. I was involved in netball to to a, a high standard and had represented South Yorkshire at the inter-counties and, and then rounders was presented as, as an opportunity for trials. And, and to be honest with you, I didn't know that rounders had an elite level. At the time, it was also when I just started wearing the headscarf and was finding suddenly I felt very visible because of I'm very aware my lack of accent and the paleness of my skin without a headscarf on until you know my second name you probably wouldn't suspect that I am a Muslim, mm. especially in 2000 when I think kind of the viewpoints of diversity were much more narrow. And in some of those other sports, it became difficult to be visibly Muslim and a sportswoman at that level. The rules in football at the time, it was tough to wear shorts and a headscarf, you couldn't. And some of my teammates had not been very kind and that had not been um, supportively educated and coaches couldn't deal with it and suddenly felt that I didn't belong there because of, I think it was being that first when I was, I was walking into unconscious bias and prejudice that people didn't know they had. And then the rules didn't allow for me to be able to be myself. In netball at the time, the rules were that you had to wear a skirt or a dress. And so I was trying to do that. And I can remember my county kit had purple, it was purple, white and um, teal green. That was the South Yorkshire kit. And we had to purchase purple tracksuit bottoms and had to get permission from the FA and from England Netball for me to be able to wear this one head covering. And there would be times I'd be there in the English Institute ready to play. And umpires are saying, you're not allowed to take to the pitch. You need to take, you need to take your trousers off. And it's like, well, I can't, I'm a Muslim. It's like, well, you need to take that off your head. And my coaches would have to travel with proof of, no, she has permission to wear this. Because the accusation was that I might put my head into somebody's eyes and get the their the fibers in their you know it could be used as an advantage and all I want to do is play so yeah. these other sports where maybe the pathway to elite level was more visible you know when I when I was playing football I, I would regularly play against the likes of Farrah Williams and Jill Scott I was in that that kind of era it was suddenly not for me mm. and then rounders came and to be honest I didn't expect a different experience and before my England rounders trial, um, my parents had contacted um, UK Sport and said, look, could you look at developing an opaque, breathable headwear? You know, she gets really hot. And during Ramadan, if I play netball and weigh myself before a match and after a match, I'd sometimes lose six or seven pounds in the wow. hour. And was just told, well, there's no demand for it. Now, if UK Sport had listened at the time, they'd be much richer for it right now mm -hmm. because it's much earlier than the now sports hijabs. But when we approached around as England and we said, look, your kit is a skirt and a T-shirt and she's a Muslim. They said, well, we'll just make a long sleeved version and she can wear trousers. So immediately some of the problems I anticipated, because that had been my experiences in other sports, was not a factor. And I know that that's because of rounders was much smaller and and they probably could have that flexibility and fluidity. And I, they probably are unaware or were unaware at the time of how important that inclusive response was because suddenly it was like, right, okay, I'm in. I look like everybody else and I'm just going to play. And the great thing is that playing rounders is not affected by my faith. Uh, it's not a sport about being objectified for having my legs out or my arms out. It's can you throw, can you catch, can you bat? And I felt really proud and when I was aware of then the statistics of being the first ever in any sport, yeah, I'm very proud of that. And I have many children. I happen to teach in a very diverse school now. I have many children who will Google me and be like, is that really you? And it's like, yes, that, that's me. And that's a really nice additional experience. But from a completely you know, selfish point of view, I felt that some sports had turned their back on me because of I wasn't quite white enough. And here I was, you know, busting a gut, trying to make my faith not a, a handicap. It's not a disability. So I would train as hard as everybody else, despite being twice as clothed. I found ways to wear my scarf. Um, the ones I used to wear 
you would have to tie and putting that tying it around my neck was not a great thing so it's like right, how can I wear it differently to make it safer and I was trying my hardest to be part of these sports but being rejected because of what was in place and the behaviors and the rules but rounders just said yeah we can we can do what you need because it's about how you play and then it made me then incredibly proud and ultimately you know 10 years later when rounders England had the kit by um, the brand cookery I was the person that they chose to model the kit alongside one of my teammates who was not a Muslim and I was incredibly proud incredibly embarrassed to be a a model but (laughs) statement of you can be anyone Mm. and play for your country and represent your country and then to go on to coach as a Muslim England um, squad and to be involved in the designing of courses for rounders and now being on the board for rounders I think it's incredibly important because of I'm not invisible in this sport and if you are looking for representation and we always talk about you can't be what you can't see inadvertently I represent and perhaps knocked on doors and asked questions from a small organization things that have then now been learned quite late by other organizations who had an opportunity. I was there. I was absolutely there in those sports knocking on that door. And I will be forever grateful and incredibly proud. I hate that I'm the first because I think 2000 is too late. Absolutely. I'm also proud that I'm the first because somebody had to be, but I understand the gravity of that. I understand what that might mean and, now certainly get told that by the children and parents who themselves say as a result of me being their daughter's PE teacher, you know, this Muslim family, they now go out walking because they've seen I can do it. So I've made it safe. I've made it appropriate. And it's been a real privilege and is still a really wonderful thing when a child first finds it out. They're like, really? You did that? It's like, yeah, I did that, kids. But it wasn't something at the time I was consciously aware of. Yeah. And and I guess just because you wanted the love of the sport, you just wanted to be accepted for a sports person. Absolutely. You chose I think, you know, the sport. Absolutely. And some people chose, and I, you know, peers of mine at the time that I knew from other areas in the UK who were Muslim made a decision they wanted to play segregated sport or they didn't want to try and be as competitive as possible. When I knew I was good. I made, I spoke to my family and said, look, I'd, I'd like to see whether or not I could. And it was, and it was always about football first. Football was my first love. And then, and then the netball and the athletics and everything else came afterwards. And it was always, what if, you know, you do, you do the daydreaming. I, mm-hmm. I can curl a ball like David Beckham. Like that, that was my thing. That was what I would do. And when it became apparent and I was heartbroken that it was not going to happen in football, not because of anything I could control, because I think I was about 10 years too early to be accepted. I was heartbroken because I'd given everything. I'd done the training, I'd turned up for the things, I'd forgiven the comments of you're wearing a tea cozy on your head and and tried not to take it personally, trying to be really aware of the fact that it's not me that's being attacked, it's the prejudices that people have. You know, the 2000s, we're talking 9-11 territory. I was 15, 16 when 9-11 happened and immediately my actual life changed because of that to then have my teammates say things or a netball opponent knowing I was marking her out of the game to pull my scarf off and throw it and an umpire not say it was contact I would find that really difficult and would take it really personally and I I started to fear that my insistence on trying to be competitive would make me fall out of love with sport because sport was turning its back on me. And then, you know, a sport that I probably just liked and loved because everyone loves rounders, but didn't take seriously, just said, you do you, and this is what we'll do to help. And it made all the difference. And I'm really proud now that lots of women choose rounders as their sport, that there have been other rounders, England Muslims. um, And I know that, I've played a part in that. And I think that's a really great kind of around, you know, point from it. We're heading into the 2020s and that's not the experience for Muslim women anymore. And and that's brilliant. And that is such a great achievement. And to go through what you've been through and the resilience at such a young age, 
in order just to do things that you loved, you, you need to be, you do need to be really proud of because you're a trailblazer mm -hmm. um, in the things that you do and then carrying it on into education as well because that passion for education and as you say, being a role model for so many um, is just so important. And, and as you've said, you've got to see it to be it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Um, and thank you for what you've done in, 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 in that time. That's just, just amazing. Um, and an amazing story. So, well, what, what you, you got into rounders then, uh, tell us a bit more about the pathway and, and how you got through the pathway and what you achieved and, and everything around sort of that, that rounders uh, yeah. talent. So, so I was picked up, as I said, um, at about 11, when I first got into secondary school and started just playing in the Sheffield leagues, which at the time were really, there were mixed leagues, there were multiple kind of Premier League championship. So I was playing lots of adult rounders and immediately learned that there was a difference because my school experience had all been innings game. So a completely different game. I played different versions of rounders, ones with boundaries, ones where you just could bat all night. And of course that would develop my skills. And then I was in, in, invited to what was a star center at the time at Sheffield where I was getting specialist training from one of the players who was in the England team. She was the uh, England bowler at the time and other passionate coaches. So I was learning that it was more than just stand and swing. And <laughs> at that point, you know, just really liking getting to grips with something that wasn't needing my family to travel all over the place. And I felt safe and crit critically, my very Muslim dad was happy that it was, you know, Islamic because of, there was no touch and it was all not objectified and all that kind of stuff. And then went to a trial. And when I went to the trial actually um, for England, I couldn't make the trial for my own age group. I was on a school um, residential and we contacted the National Rounds Association and said, look, I, I can't make my trial date in Birmingham. And they were like, oh, well, don't worry. Just come to the one for the year above thinking that it'd be great experience. I was like, yeah, like, okay, yeah, sure, fine. And um, I can remember we went down the weather was awful so we turned up and it was absolutely thrashing it with rain I'm like what how you can't play it was like torrential so we did the whole trial in a in a sports hall um which I I was like right well how can we do it? there's 50 of us in here there's only you know there's only so much you can do I'll just get stuck in and to be honest I, I, f I felt like I had an all right day um but nothing special but apparently because I had the phone call on the way home to say you've actually been selected into the senior squad for the year above um which was wonderful apparently there was one throw that I did that uh, it was the, the clincher um I was stood on second and I received a ball got somebody out and just sent it and it was because of it was a no look and it was flat and fast and it went exactly to where it needed to be and they were like well if you can do that in a sports hall you're fine. And, and that was fabulous. I can remember telling my parents, I've just got into the England team. Um, <laughs> and, and thereafter, every year, lots of training, different coaches. And I kind of went through and very quickly. So I remember my first international, actually, I got a ball smacking my head from a bowler. She bowled a no ball right there. And I was seeing double for a little bit, sorted my head out, got in the box and smashed it, which was fabulous. And uh, for two or three years I was just developing as a player but then also getting the chance to play for the England A which essentially was a kind of um, an adult feeder team to play for the under 21s and then actually fast-tracked into the adult squad proper so very quickly I was playing really good level rounders with many of the players actually from Sheffield because a lot of them happened to come from there but being involved in the, the first round as World Cup, being involved in trips to Jersey, being involved in different opportunities to represent my country and captaining my team, getting the chance to captain the England adult team, getting the chance to um, captain the under 21s and learning a lot more about playing at that level. Then I made the decision when I went to university to take a year away. I was moving to a completely different side of the country. I was like, right, I'm 12 months out. I just need to consolidate my studies. And during the first year, I had a phone call about potentially being a coach as well. 
and it was a case of going look we know you're aspiring to be a teacher we know that you're very keen to get involved you've got your coaching badges there's an opening in under 13 development which is essentially the, the, the kind of the second team within the under 13 to the youngest age group and as a 19 year old I was like yeah okay yeah that's fine I, I, I'll be up for that let's I, I can get stuck in it is essentially what I'm going to be paid to do for a living so I got involved and helped design the trials um and I helped actually completely change the way in which trials were done so that they were more consistent so that we had a definite framework to follow and then my first squad I inherited 21 players and looked at some of the things I'd learned from all the other sports I'd done and so I know what good coaching looks like I know what good um communication looks like and it was at a time when Randers England was probably well, definitely much more amateur than it is now and and there was not the identity that the sport has. So it was for me to go, right, okay, how do I build this squad? Okay, I know where my players are from. And I had players from Devon all the way to Newcastle. I know I have contacts because of my other sports. And I mapped out, right, we'll, we'll have four trainings in a square around the country. So at every point, everybody travels, even me. And that's really important to build that team ethos. And we'll do two weekends to try and build the, the team element and I looked at how I would design training because I actually think that rounds is one of the worst taught sports in schools. I, I, I do think that. Yeah. Um, and it's not a case of training means turning up and playing nine against nine. So breaking down, what is it that these players need? We've done a really good trials process. I know what these players can and can't do. And they had proper communication. They had um, full season training. And this team that essentially was the weakest and most inexperienced in the England set beat all the teams they played because they were coached properly mm. and many of the players then fast-tracked into the a squad because they were coached properly and one of my proudest moments in in as a rounders um person is that no team i ever coached lost a match wow um, that they, is a big call and they didn't lose internationals and then they were beating the england squads two or three years above them and beating them really well, not because of mistakes. There was a game in Perth against the under 18s and my squad with the under 16s at the time. The under 18s were all out for two, which at the time there were some really big hitters, some big names that still have continued to play for a very long time. And they were all out for two. And these 16 year olds were also having fun. They were enjoying it and they were being completely respectful and very characterful as a team. And so, they, and then they absolutely obliterated them and scored, you know, 10 themselves. It was a brilliant performance and not something that that England squad above them had ever experienced, even in their own international matches. And what we did, what I did was work really hard alongside playing still to make sure my role was to develop these players. And many of them have gone on to then coach England squads of their own or progress right through to the adult level and people within rounders that knew how I worked or had watched my sessions have very much said so and so's coaching now but it's it is done as rounders and, and they've heard things and so I was naturally building that sustainability plan because I think it's really important that you play around as half of rounders is psychological it's not about skill half of rounders is ultimately strategy and bluffing bluffing the way you're going to hit it, bluffing the way you're going to bowl it, trying to psych out the opposition. And we do that to ourselves when we walk into the square. And we worked really hard on all of those kind of features. And I benefited from working with some amazing coaches in all my sports experience. And these players got that experience, but three rounders. And we had a presentation evening and I would find a way to be financially viable but to record accurately their caps. I designed proper certificates that recorded the caps for my players. There was a presentation, there were players awards, things that Rams England at the time couldn't provide for everyone. So inadvertently, again, what I was doing for my players, because it's the experience that I felt that it needed, the professionalism that it needed, became a, a kind of a best practice approach for others to follow. And again, I'm very proud of that. And because of that, when Rounders England did rebrand and looked at changing its level two courses to follow 
the national qualification framework, I was invited to be part of the steering and advisory group. And if you do do the level two course, and you look in the back of the book, my name's in there and the schemes of, and the examples of the sessions I happen to be the ones I, I actually wrote for my university degree. Um, they're in there. And I'm very proud that some of the work that I learned about myself and through rounders is now part of how you teach rounders and how you coach rounders for that consistency and that was that was kind of my pathway I just for 10 for 12 years was involved um and then there was a a, a, neg a slightly disappointing reason for walking away from rounders and rounders England have not hidden from this fact and we've always kind of worked together on how this would be shared but there was a a bad experience for a coach that I had when I was in the adult squad who made a reference to me with a racial slur in my absence. And I found out about it via teammates and whistleblowers. And this was at a time when challenging racism and understanding how to challenge systematic racism was just not done in sport. You know, I refer to what's happened in cricket recently. Mm -hmm. Those things could have been dealt with and, 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 were not at the time and I we it was the police categorized it as a racial incident and I went to the rounds organization at the time and it's very important to say that nobody that's on the present board has had anything to do with this they, they've apologized for the behavior and actions of a group of people that are no longer associated with the sport um we sat with them and shared what we had and the organization chose the more comfortable option to not challenge and instead to say, but it's not that deep, Donna, you could just get over it. And so, well, no, I was a hundred miles away and my coach referred to me in a racial term more than once. And it isn't a joke. So after having all this experience where the sport had gone, we can just make it happen. A person that happened to be within the organization at the time completely broke that. And I was in a position, this was in 2012, as a family, we discussed it and it was like, well, I have represented proudly this organization. I don't think I can continue to do that at the moment because of when it mattered, the organization could not represent me. And it meant that at the end of 2012, I made the difficult decision to retire as both a coach and a player. But I then also made the other decision to continue to push and support rounders as a teacher. I had four children in my classes at the time playing for England to still attend their trials and support them in the same way I would have done. But to myself, just take a back step from rounders because I didn't feel I could represent something that showed a frailty to not be principled and do the right thing. I never talked about it online. I didn't didn't go that route we you know I deliberately made a choice that no I need to try and model how things should be done mm -hmm. and when Rounders England had and appointed its new board um, and its new CEO so Natalie Justice Dean she reached out to me she reached out to me through Twitter actually and said I've been made aware that you are someone I absolutely need to talk to and that there's been an incident and this must have been pre-COVID, just about, I think it was about 2018, 2019. So I'd had now some considerable time away. And in between, of course, I was still playing for my league teams and I was still involved in Rounders. And Rounders England had a few times come back to me and said, we, we, we're actually noticing the difference of your coaching not being there. Do you want to be back involved? And I was like, it's going to need an apology. I don't need it public. I need an apology that you handled it badly because that is what happened. And they weren't prepared. I was told that, you know, it's been it's been long enough now. You should be over it. And, you know, you look at how cricket and Yorkshire cricket are having to fall over themselves to apologise. And rightly so. I remained dignified and said, well, I can't represent you still. We're not ready. But Natalie reached out and she said, look, I, I think I'm aware, but I need a bit more information. And I gave her the full truth. And in unequivocally immediately she went well I need to apologize on behalf of the organization I was like well I appreciate that but it's not your apology but as a result of that she said look do you want a press release we can put things out there I was like no it's never been about that mm -hmm. it's never been about that but Rounders England was at the time using a slogan which um they're still using the we are all rounders I was like, but you weren't all rounders mm -hmm. when it mattered you went dark and so I chose to no longer represent. I can't lie and say, yeah, it's a great organization. When at the time for me personally, it was not that way. 
So Natalie then said, right, well, this is where we are. This is where Rounders is going. This is the plan. Um, I really hope that you can be involved. And, and that was all it needed. And so from a conversation in 2019, slightly delayed by what then happened to the world, um, we started working more closely together. They dipped into my knowledge again in coaching and development for some kind of informal consultancy and guidance, utilizing my school experience, utilizing my experience with examination courses, looking at the skills matrix to try and get rounders back on the GCSE and A-level specs. And then now I am essentially coaching coaches through the talent program. And I designed the talent development days. And in September, 2022, became an independent member of the board. So it's been an interesting journey. And I did think about not mentioning that dark patch because of it isn't something I publicly put on record. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to see the integrity of the organization. Yeah to see that the present gatekeepers of this sport are not afraid of those difficult things. I was, for all intents and purposes, probably one of the most familiar faces and rounders at that time. And the prejudice of a person that is not part of rounders was allowed to exist. And it was disastrous for them, I think. It was disastrous for me in terms of, I stopped playing for England early. I stopped coaching players early. And now I'm in a position where I think my name and rounders are again very much aligned and synonymous. But I think that's an important message because it was never the fault of the sport. It was never the fault of the organization. It was the people that ran it and the people that were not perhaps trained or aware of how impactful a throwaway statement 100 miles away could be. Mm-hmm. And that at all times we need to role model and, and protect this sport. So even though I was gutted as a player, I turned up to the trials of my students for this sport that broke my heart three months before, because that was not Rounders' fault. And it is something that I think has been a very important experience for Rounders going forward from where they were to know that there were those issues um because I think it forces them now to always ask that question of where are our gaps where are our biases and because of that I think it is now one of these sports that is incredibly inclusive and is doing all of the work not just for racial and, and religious diversity for diverse rounders players um and I am very proud of how the organization has remarketed rebranded realigned its vision um but that's it from a thunderstorm to now this sunday i'll be coaching the mixed hub so there are 80 players turning up and i'm going to be involved in making sure that we start to identify who might be the england squad from that and that is an amazing story and also a life lesson as you said that how important it is not to let things go because yeah. actually what could have happened after if you had let that comment go and trivialized it um it could have then become rife within in rounders couldn't it absolutely and I think you know I had a I did have that um flip of a coin kind of decision to make of do I do I make this public at this point I knew I had a profile I was you know, I was speaking internationally. I, I'm regularly in the media. I, I'm I'm a published writer. I, in 2012, carried the Olympic torch. So my profile was, was large at this moment in time. And I possibly could have put the sport in an uncomfortable position. But my intention has always been to represent the sport to the best of my ability. As a role model, I'm very aware that, and became very aware that being a prominent visible Muslim matters and I chose what I think and I still think was a dignified way of 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 kind of handling the situation I only shared what happened after the revelations through cricket because of I'm the female elite equivalent and I think it was really important and I incidentally am on the board for a cricket charity I think it's really important to show that it wasn't just cricket 
this was a period of time when carelessness by people in sport was allowed to exist. This was a previous time when things that we now would absolutely challenge wasn't. And this is where then I think we lost what was really great about being a diverse country. We have to challenge those things, whether it's not allowing someone to play because of their religion, orientation, language, whatever. We have to challenge those things because that's the best thing about sport. It doesn't belong to anyone. It doesn't belong to anyone. And sport should be this arena where the only thing that is judged is the result and how you play. But that hasn't been the truth. And it isn't the truth yet in every in every sport. But I, I think my family and I handled it um, the best that we could, but it also then meant that the sport was, was not being punished. It was not rounders as fault. It was the fault of a person. And then the people that allowed for that person to then be not held to account. And I hope that at some point they receive the training that they would now, I think, receive if they were in those positions of authority within an organization like rounders. And I hope that the other person has reflected because the only the only loss really was a personal loss. I lost it out. I took myself away, but it was the right decision. And what an amazing story and what an amazing um, pioneer and what footprints you've left for now and future generations, not just with you know, taking a stand, which can often be lonely. Uh, it can be isolating, can't it? Yeah. Um, and then being able to do it with your head held high, as well as all the things that you've given round us in your experience with it, which is, is absolutely phenomenal. And when you look at that aspect, what are you most proud of, 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 of what you, you, well, you're still doing in rounders, um, but uh, you're actually legacy that, that you're leaving in your way. Do you know what? That's a good question. Um, I have to say that the, the new iteration of the development plan, which um, includes these talent development days and the, the regional hubs. What I've really enjoyed, I, I, coaching, teaching, they're very, very similar. So arguably I practice coaching five hours a day if I get to be a teacher, obviously I work in, in leadership within a school, but when Rounders England approached me and it was um, Rianne Lilly, who was the development officer at the time, She's look, we've got this new idea. We want these days, these development days. Could you look at designing it and, and coming up with what that would look like? It's from this time till this time. And almost the, the template, the, the, the standard experience for players. And I worked on it with a few other members of, of kind of the rounders community because of, we felt we needed some umpiring. We felt we needed some other key skills and it was about doing it in collaboration and then putting it together, piloting it with players. The feedback from the players has been phenomenal. And more than that, Rounders England realizing that they have an issue. We, you know, it's, it's a no hidden secret that Rounders is growing faster than it's got coaches to coach. So having coaches come and attend a development day essentially to shadow me, to learn how to deliver the development days so that we have this consistent approach. And now, when I'm two years into this program, I go places and coaches come up to me and they're like, oh, we're always thinking, what would Dana say um, when we're <laughs> delivering without you? And, and I didn't realise that that was the impact. I had a coach a few months ago was doing her assessment at one of these days so she was like I, I need to let you know that you've been giving me anxiety I was like, Hi, what have I done? she's like no you've not done anything I just know you're here today and I was like and she's like I'm being assessed and I don't want you to watch my session and think that's rubbish I was like I'm not assessing you she was like no but you're the standard and to know that my rounders peers value not just 
what I know about rounders, but the development and the training that they get by coaching with me. And it's done in such a way that it then inspires them. This is someone that I used to play for England with and was in that team when I was 11 with the pint glass. So I've known this person since I was 11. I was like, why are you scared of me? She's like, I'm not, but you're the standard when it comes to coaching. I think the thing I'm most proud of is that the care that I have for rounders and coaching it properly so that players understand other coaches, whether they are coaches that were coached by me and then became coaches or coaches now that I work with and assist and support using my professional skills alongside my love for rounders is building this workforce and that they are, they are attributing their coaching to well, it's because Dana was there and I, I learned this from her and she did this. And I feel that that's a really important part that anybody can be a coach. You just have to care enough. And I think coaching is about caring. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud that then when I'll turn up somewhere, players who've coached me, they're like, oh, I'm so glad you're back. I love your sessions. So for me, it's been that spreading of the game. And then I will be forever proud that in my teaching career, I have coached 12 women who then went on to play for their country. And at one point, I think my school, including myself and my players, we had the largest um, number of England players in one area and the BBC came and they did something for BBC Breakfast. I'm very proud of that, that many of my students, I've spotted them in school, nurtured them. They've gone on to represent their country. But I think it is the fact that the, the, the way of coaching rounders in a much more deliberate manner is being taken on by passionate other gatekeepers and we're spreading it across the country. And Rams England is facilitating that, but they've trusted me with it. And I feel really privileged at that, at that fact. Wow. And that is just amazing. And it feels like you're spreading your dust, your, your magic dust all over the country, uh, not in just in, in the, in, in England, but throughout the UK and internationally. Uh, about your work in practice and it's been an absolute joy talking to you I don't know if there's anything else that we've missed that you think right I'd want to get that in but th that was I could talk to you all day so but I can't <laughs> do that because we'll, we won't get the hits <laughs> now I think I think the biggest thing is to for rounders now I think it's next stage it's really trying to connect with people and I really like that they're challenging themselves to try and get more men into the sport because Rams has absolutely got it for women. It's there. Yeah. And, you know, in, in June, actually, I'm attending a tournament as a guest that is just full of Muslim teams. So we've gone from a position where I was the only one to now everyone. And I think it's such an important little sport that does deserve more money because it uses it well that does deserve the respect because what it's trying to do, what it says it wants to do and what it's trying to do are the same thing, but also has challenges. Rounders is desperate to grow, deserves to be on the specification for GCSE and A-level. It is not something that you can just hit it, whack it and you're fine. It is incredibly technical. And anybody that does not know that needs to come and watch the, the, you know, the talent mm -hmm. players play. I think rounders has always been that sport that everyone loves doing on the beach or you can just go and do it as a family. And I love that it's accessible in that way. But I hope that in 20 years time, more people are aware that it's also unbelievably competitive. It really matters. I've broken my fingers about 20 times because of rounders. Rounders is not just for joy. It brings better people joy, but it's not just a beach game. It's not just that thing that you do in the summer after a barbecue. It's great that you can do that. But try telling some of the women that I coach that it doesn't matter. And, you know, they'll bite your head off. And I think that's a really nice place for the sport to be. And I am incredibly proud to be associated, it, associated with it in all the many ways I am. And really keen to see where they take it next. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure and you're infectious and I just know you will, you know, with everything that you've said now and, and how you're taking the sport, it's just going to grow through, through, through your enthusiasm and passion for the sport. Thank you ever so much for your time. No problem.